But one question I have for you is, are you opposed to short selling as a concept? Or do you appreciate that short selling serves a purpose in the market? And it's just that that it was uh, aimed at the wrong entities? I believe both. And this is the fun. uh, This is the fun little nuanced, but also kind of a cop out answer. I think that it's less of a cop out because I think that something can be innately predatory, uh, but at the same time, serve a purpose. Right. Catfish serve a purpose, even though. Oh, actually, I'm thinking of lionfish. Lionfish with their oh. terrible stingers serve a purpose. Uh, a roaring kitty fish, let's say. Uh, and yes, they, yes. But they're invasive. <laughs> right. They they certainly are destroying ecosystems. A short attack in its in essence is predatory. Right. It's taking advantage of uh, driving a price down because you're betting on the price going down. Right. Very few other instruments in this world in the financial system is based on hurting a company and betting on it being hurt. So that, yeah. that in essence well, is, I, I don't know, but is it always, I'm not sure. It's not betting on it being uh, hurt. It's betting that the, uh, the management have not revealed or expressed in full the true position, which is worse than what is currently perceived. So in other words, it's just, it's a, it's a constant reality check. But the thing with GameStop that's so interesting is that the the um, the fan base is so huge, and it didn't fit with the traditional analysts who are going. These people just sell games from a store, and everything's going to be downloaded online. There is no future for this company, and all the actual gamers had an emotional connection to the company, and so the perception of value was so profoundly split apart. Yes. Usually when you have short sellers, the perception of value is finer, the, the distinction between the two sides. I think but this really was like a world apart. I agree. I think Cody Becker put it really well in the live chat. He says, I appreciate short selling, but not naked short selling. Naked shorts okay. creates too much error and potential for corruption. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Well, and again, you know, it's really interesting to me is where do uh, hedge funds get the um, collateral for doing this? They borrow from pension funds. And a whole bunch of pension funds in recent years have started to say, we're not going to lend our, our, our equity anymore for short sellers. So the market's starting to be constrained because the pension funds are going, uh, I don't know if this is good for the economy or good for the markets. Right. And and the idea behind Kat DeLuca, thank you so much for that super. I just want to shout it out before I, I cover that topic. Kat says, love you, Andrew and Meatball. Please ask about the Graham Leach Blyly Act that deregulated oh, yeah. the banks. Uh, <laughs> this act has caused what is happening. So what, what, what exactly do, is your opinion on that act specifically? Oh, yeah. Graham Leach Blyly goes way back. Um, look, I, I'd go back further than that. I would start with um, Sandy Weil when he was the chief executive of City, City Bank. And he made this argument, and when was that? It's like in the, it's back in the 80s. And he made this argument that banks couldn't grow because they weren't permitted to get into other areas like insurance and they, they basically faced so many regulatory constraints that banks couldn't grow. And so the regulators made a decision to allow Citibank to become Citigroup. Mm. And suddenly banks were doing many, many more things than ever before. And that helped contribute to this world where financial derivatives have become such a powerful force in the economy because that's what banks are creating and selling as brand national derivatives. So then on the regulatory side, all of these pieces of legislation like Graham Leach Blyly fundamentally aimed at how do you protect the public from this sort of uh, financial um, financialization of the economy. That, that's what's at the heart of it. And the fact is we just continue to have a tussle between financial innovation, which can hurt people, Hmm. And yes. financial innovation, which also brings many good things, you know, it's like cuts both ways. And, and that's, uh, I think, going down to Jesse B. Truck and also put out in the super. I, I wanted to say thank you guys for the super. If I don't mention yours, I'm trying to be mindful of our guest. Uh, of our guest. Uh, Jesse says shorting should be allowed, but never over 100 percent. If the company starts to turn around, shorts should have to cover at a certain point of resistance. 
Yeah, and this is a technical issue that the, the Fed and the SEC have looked at over the years of where did they draw that line, and nobody's in agreement quite there. But, um, but yes, here's the thing. Um, do you, does the community that's watching you really get into the regulatory framework? And, and is, do they see that as the answer to this problem that it's, or is it really a market driven issue so that it's just so enticing to get into uh, GameStop? Do you see what I mean? Is it really a regulatory issue or is it a market issue? I think that when we heard it in Congress, first of all, my live chat gets a little bit of wild when we have the congressional uh, hearings shown live on oh, the yeah. channel. Uh, politics kind of drives people to to certain extremes. But I would say that the general consensus is that if the answer is taxes, I think my live chat is not quite for that. But if it is for the SEC or any other regulatory body to do their job, which both sides are for, right? The main uh, argument that we heard in Congress from Republican side was that the SEC already has the tools it needs. Uh, Loudermilk was a strong proponent for that. And uh, not just because I love the name Loudermilk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in that essence, does uh, the question is, if the SEC already has the tools, the only, uh, the only I think two factors is, does it have enough funding to enforce those tools and does it have enough willpower to enforce those yeah. tools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and there, 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 there are people who make the argument that all these regulatory agencies are not driven by the desire to actually enforce the rules, but rather to be successful. Mm. And the definition of success is that you not only win, but you get to enforce fines. And so if the fines are big enough, then is it really worth the effort? Um, you know, that's a, a kind of uh, agency level problem. And one of the reasons, you know, people think, well, if my, you know, if a problem is small enough, nobody will address it because it's just not worth it, the time and the effort. Hmm. So this is a, and again, we're dealing with financial innovation and, um, that's why that question earlier on NFTs is really interesting because that's epic financial innovation. And one of the problems in government that I realized, it's like, a, imagine like around the world uh, boat race where the boats are the fastest, most valuable, most expensive in the world with the best crews. And the regulators are literally like in a dinghy. Like they don't, they don't have resources. So they can't even see over the horizon where the race is happening. They're just aware there's a race out there somewhere and we should be regulating that race, but they can't keep up with the technology. They, because you know, what you get paid to work at the SEC is a fraction of what you get paid to work on Wall Street. So yes. they're always losing the talent, right? So there's a, a real issue about how does government keep up with the pace of innovation with regulation. That's the most resonant part of the big uh, of the Wolf of Wall Street for me is the yeah. the scene on the yacht where they have the FBI, I think, uh, investigator come in and they're saying uh, you ride the subway every day. And he like tries to shake off that image. And we all want this like beautiful, suave FBI guy to come investigate Melvin and Plotkin and and Mr. Kenny G. But at the end of the day, they're still going to be riding the subway home. And that was the scene that hit me hardest, that even though they busted Jordan Belfort, uh, he still has to ride that subway home. <laughs> They're never going to catch up in that sense.